What we're going to be doing today is we're going to be talking about differential weathering and erosion. Now, I know that you've heard this before that, or in another video, but we're going to go ahead and dig a little deeper into it to make sure you really understand and do a little bit of a practice. Here's the one that I saw, and um, you'll see that we have these big, massive boulders that look like they're out of place. Where'd they come from? Why are they there? It all comes down to making sure we understand weathering and erosion. So yes, we're still talking about weathering and erosion. Quick review, weathering is talking about breaking down rock into smaller parts. It can happen either physical weathering, which we're talking about abrasion, frost wedging, root pry, or we could talk about chemical weathering, chemically altering the rock. It's breaking the rock down into something different than the original rock. So it might have started out as limestone, but when the acid gets on the limestone, it starts to break down the calcite, it's a different kind of rock. That's weathering. Erosion is when you then have the broken down rock and it gets taken away by either water or wind. That's the difference between weathering and erosion. Differential weathering and erosion. It's just that, looking at the first word, breaking it down into its parts, different. So differential weathering and erosion is when we're talking about two rock layers that are right next to one another and they're weathering and eroding at a different rate from one another, which causes these crazy different land structures. So you can see right here we have a picture of a big rock sitting on top, on top of what so like, looks like a small column. Top rock that's more resistant to the weathering that's happening in that climate or in that area. And so we do need to make sure we are able to identify resistant rock layers versus ones that are non-resistant, meaning weather and any road at a much faster rate. So again, oftentimes these landforms form because they weather, the rocks weather and road at different rates. You'll oftentimes see cliffs, which help us identify our resistant layers, layers that are resistant to the weathering that's occurring, and then rock that's typically non-resistant. The climate is extremely important to help us understand this. We have to know a little bit about the climate in order to, for us to be able to help understand how that impacts weathering and erosion. So remember we talked about Grand Canyon. It's Arizona. So we're thinking desert. But it also has extreme temperatures, high temperatures in the daytime, and really cold temperatures at night. And so we have lots of frost wedging or ice wedging that's happening in a desert in the Grand Canyon. And shale doesn't do well in that type of situation. So you'll start to see it break down. And one of the things that helps us then understand is that the shale will go ahead and form these sloping layers, whereas our sandstone and our limestone are more resistant to it. However, when we think about warm, humid climates, limestone isn't as resistant in those kind of climates because there's lots of water and we know when there's lots of water and especially lots of plants which that happens to be um, where plants like to grow in warm humid climates we had then a lots of carbonic acid or acid forming and so we see lots of weathering of limestone so we can't just go ahead and say oh, limestone psh, see cliffs or wherever we see limestone we're gonna see that it's a resistant layer that's not necessarily the case. We have to think about climates. So one of the things you're going to need to make sure you start to understand when you get to your final project is knowing that you have to ask about climate. You have to go ahead and look at um, then also the, the formations, um, describing the formations, and that helps you identify the rock. So we're going to do a little bit of practice. Here we have the Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon, you know, number one, it's desert. Okay, so desert, we know there's not a lot of water. So we're not going to be talking a lot about chemical weathering. It means we're going to be talking a lot about abrasion and then also a lot about frost wedging. And so here we see a cliff right here, and here we see a slope. So the slope tells us that we must be dealing with shale because it doesn't handle well with frost wedging. And so it starts to break down and crumble. The clay absorbs the water, and then when it freezes, breaks it apart. So we have shale right here, and then you'll see that this must be, we can tell, must be the resistant layer, which is either sandstone or limestone. So then we have to dig a little deeper to understand which one's which. Here, let's do a little bit more practice. We have a structure in Mon uh, Monument Valley, which is in Utah. So we know we're dealing with frost wedging. 
So which one do you think is shale? If you said the sloping layer, you're right. Top layer is sandstone. So you would either guess sandstone or limestone, and we'd have to dig deeper to find out which one's which. But by looking at the structure and knowing about the climate, we can identify the type of rock. Now, we're gonna kind of shift gears in this next part and talk about Niagara Falls. And so what's actually happening at Niagara Falls is that the water's underturning when it's falling off of the falls. It's underturning and it's going ahead and weathering and eroding the shale underneath the hard limestone layer. And so what ends up happening is there's this big overhang of limestone. And this limestone then, once it's no longer supported by the shale because the shale's been weathered and eroded away, it falls and it breaks. And that forms a big, huge, massive boulders that you see at the bottom of the rock um, of Niagara Falls. And what's ended up happening, what we've started to notice, is that Niagara Falls is actually retreating, moving back about a meter each year. And that has to do with the fact that there's so much weathering and erosion that's occurring at the base of the falls that's happening to the shale, the soft rock underneath. Now we're starting to see that it's different, it's eroding at different rates and causing the limestone to break down. Um, because there's nothing supporting it underneath. And so we're starting to see that this Niagara Falls is shifting and changing um, a meter a year, which is pretty drastic when we look at how oftentimes weathering and erosion occurs. Um, it's a slow process over a long period of time. A meter a year is pretty a uh, big rate um, compared to uh, lots of other places. Now, Make sure you kind of quickly review. We have this in your notes. This is going to be something really important for when we practice on Wednesday in class. And uh, we'll be seeing you Wednesday. See ya.